Hello. This is... What are we called again? Ezekiel... Ezekiel Beck. Okay, we're Ezekiel Beck, and we've written a story for you tonight. We hope that you're comfortable out there in YouTube land, and that you'll enjoy our, our little story. So, we're going to take turns reading the chapters here. This will be chapter one, which will be read by... us. <laughs> <laughs> My story, which is really your story, starts where all our stories normally end, the rebirth of the karmic soul, or in other words, death. I was living in Manchester at the time. <laughs> My daughter and wife had just let, left me for a robot keeper, a new model named Anorax. Well, I didn't mind. I was working on a new thesis, speculating on the origin of the people, a seemingly advanced race discovered only 50 years prior in the Himalayas. My training was in metaphysical histrology. I was a historian who used the technology of a lost race to study them by warping back in time. This didn't involve warping myself, of course, but instead small collection devices that would evade detection. This field was a new one. When you first discovered the Black City, it was a shock to humanity. A warren of tunnels buried beneath Mount Everest, technology still operating but vacant completely. In the years that followed, many of my colleagues were lost, killed among the traps of the catacombs. It was the sheerest luck, then, when we discovered the device, now housed in London, which would allow us to bend time. We each had to book time on the device, but an unusual knack for determining rich nodes, which I felt out by intuition and experience, I dutifully logged my discoveries, as it did others, and soon we came to an impressive store of knowledge about the lack. But one April morning, during my shift piloting the device, I would make my own significant discovery. This one I would not log, for reasons I will now explain for the first time in my life. I know where they went. It is simplest to just explain it, rather than describe the process by which I realized the facts about it. The Malak, at some point about a million years ago, selected a small group to travel into the future. Their technology allowed them only to travel into the past. Now we may all tra travel into the future if we simply go on living. So the Malak, traveling into the future, meant only surviving. So the group that was selected were called the people, and they were frozen cryogenically. A date was programmed into the controller to wake them a million years hence, and Malak, the, the rest of the Malak transported themselves whole a million years into the past. This had two purposes. One, no Malak could return to the moment the people were frozen to interfere with the trip. And two, in their belief system, it was a balanced offering. These facts themselves staggered me. But then, something even more incredible came up. I made the calculation to determine the awakening time. It was in just three months. I had to move fast. There was only one way to get into the catacombs, and that was to convince the society on the ground of an imperative mission. I did some research. A researcher close to the project had been lost some years past while exploring the catacombs. A thought struck me. Perhaps I could convince her that he had been frozen in a glacier or flash melt. We could then mount a rescue by traveling the site with a kit, extract his head, reach the transfer point at the summit, and he'll have a helicopter return it quickly to have him <laughs> reinstated in a robotic host. My true goal was simple. I would reach the area where the people were frozen, and we'd extract one at random. I would Sorry, insist to be present when it was reinstated. But before the scheduled empowering, I would sneak in and jump the gun. It would then be to me to make first contact with the Malak. This would be a complex lie, of course, but complexities were my bread and butter. So I set to work immediately. I needed information on the nearby villages in order to concoct my story. So I short drive to Berkshire Abbey. End of chapter one. All right, we're uh, just loading up chapter two here. I should just read it. Like a professional. The bishop provided me with a packet of historical documents and left it up to me to worm my way into the project. The lead, Professor Lauren Thorin, was easy to find in the university faculty directory. The hard part would be to convince her I was indispensable, while disguising my true goal of sabotaging the project. I spent many nights poring over the old papers, composing and deleting the email until I decided on my approach. So I started. Subject, the secret under Lethbridge. To L. Thorin at email obscured. Body, Professor Thorin. Though we have never met, our ancestors have. Many centuries ago, your great-grandfather, the esteemed Dr. Eliezer Thorne, fell helplessly in love with my biological mother, Janet. 
<laughs> Janet Babbage, their love was forbidden, especially after her death. And so your ancestor devised a procedure to cyrogenically freeze the dead until one day in the future they might be brought back to life, cured, or, <laughs> or at least uploaded into the post-singularity simulation network he proposed for the more efficient storage of human souls. This may have worked if the post-singularity intelligence had not become obsessed with V.Y. Canis Major and used the top 1,000 kilometers of Jupiter's atmosphere as fuel to get there, but I digress. As you know, Miss Dr. Thorin had not yet perfected his technique at the time of Janet's death, and so her body was not stored in such a way it could be restored. Instead, some 34 years ago, an expedition found what remained of her body and extracted some unfertilized eggs, which they then raised in an incubation chamber to produce myself. So, it's in our joint interest to seek out the secret facility your ancestor had built to store the greatest minds of his generation when he was at the peak of his power. While you may know the general location, I have uncovered a trove of documents that can be used to locate it exactly. The only thing I ask in exchange for this information is that I accompany you on any expedition to this locale. <laughs> okay. After all, perhaps the spark between your ancestor and mine might repeat in this generation. After consideration, I deleted the final line and sent the email from a single-use email address. The reply was nearly instant. Meet me at the Jittery Cow tomorrow at one twenty. Bring no one. L. Laura Thorin was taller than I expected, and older, but I suppose universities don't often update faculty photos. And Laura, the prodigy, had gotten full tenured professorship by the age of fourteen for her biochemical research. I showed her a photo here, a photo there from my cache, and she agreed to take me on if I passed the tests of solace. A skilled legilimens with a well visited psychic booth on the Ninth Avenue Market. <laughs> right, I agreed. <laughs> I agreed, knowing the bishop could provide me a holy counter spell, but as Laura pointed to the door, a darkness fell over me as solace. A creature never rightly seen by the human eye entered the cafe. I saw, in my mind, as I imagine a cat sees, a kind of kit consisting of a large glass bell attached to a complex mechanical base descend from the sky, supported by an ugly blanket held by four hands with arms extending into heaven. I saw, again in my mind, the numerical GPS coordinates that were already written on a scrap inside my envelope although in much more admirable, ornate handwriting. I saw, thirdly in my mind, the Facebook page of someone described as the greatest Sherpa since Furbatashi, who single-handedly climbed Mount Everest twice in one go without descending. That is, he ascended from the base to the summit once physically, and then from the summit he ascended again to the same summit on perhaps a higher plane of existence. This Sherpa, Leroy, was not quite that good. And then the vision slowly faded out, and I felt the presence leave. Did I pass the tests? I could not know. End of chapter two. <clears throat> Our meeting with Solas, though harrowing, had gone well. We had the kit, the tomb GPS coordinates, and acclaimed excellent Sherpa. The interior of the cafe felt less menacing with him gone, but we were still on edge. News reports, irrelevant to us, flashed across view screens. We gazed at them silently until we were sure he had left. Laura spoke. So, the plan. We head for the burial ground and get my father. The temple, fuck. Oh, of course they would put the resurrection chamber on the summit. Well, fuck. Well, we have to get there before tomorrow. I hesitated. We should take the catacombs. The weather is too unpredictable. I've been brought to solve the traps but yet to prove useful. But I was most afraid to be out on exposed rock in winter. Absolutely not. Passing traps, that's plan B. We go overland to the coordinate we have, and we find a way in. The catacombs are death. I felt deflated, but could see the rationale. She didn't have the background in 
Malk poetry. Didn't understand that to a true historian the traps would be obvious, but I wouldn't defy her again. We finished our coffees and left, tipping generously as a kind of insurance in case we returned late. The mountainside was foreboding, but the skies were holding for now. We set out. We broke after four hours hard hiking. Leroy was proving adequate, but we didn't trust him yet. And the, sh the shadow of solace seemed to be haunting us. He had no reason to doubt the story we fed him. But nevertheless, we had every reason to fear him. That man, if he thought we were going to desecrate the tomb. Leroy had taken out our extra water and we were refilling our canteens. Laura, it's getting colder. I regretted it as soon as I had said it. She came back. Fuck, fuck what is with... Leroy suddenly swept his arm in a chopping motion and singled for us to get down. We ducked. Soon there were footsteps. Light, hunter-like. Solace. I glanced at Laura, and we saw each other's panic. We both looked desperately to Leroy, who was hastily riding a charge rifle. <laughs> if he was complicit with Solace somehow, he wasn't acting it. Suddenly he stood. Sir, freeze! Leroy's voice held unexpected command. The rifle leveled at a nearby shrub, steady, from which two hands slowly appeared. Thinking it was Solace, we felt certain to die in spite of the rifle. Such was his stature, until we saw the hands were those of a woman. Marsha! Leroy dropped the rifle to the ground. A mistake. A discharge. Kabam! Sending us ducking instinctively. When we uncovered our eyes... <laughs> where, okay, where, uh, where is it? Uh, Leroy is already embracing and conversing with the newcomer in their strange language, oblivious to the near catastrophe. Miss, this is Marsha. She is an excellent Sherpa. My teacher. Miss, it will not be any extra cards. Please agree. Laura stood and dusted off. Fuck, be careful with the rifle. So we have another Sherpa? Fine, that's fine. Whatever, fuck. Let's just, we're gonna move on. It was another three hours to the burial ground coordinate. We found no obvious sign or marker. The wind was beginning to pick up, cold and foreboding. And it seemed we reached a dead end. A lie that Solas sold us. Then Marcia gestured. This way, miss. Barely visible path led through some dick, stick brush, which Leroy chopped handily. This led to a crevice, barely wide enough for us to fit through, but squeezing in we saw it, a blue light shining. This was the sign we were looking for, our first taste of the impossible. The glow of the tomb of the people forever alight. The wall was speculated to hold hundreds of the people, but just as we reached it, we saw the sky clouding ominously outside. Laura barked, fuck, get to work! Leroy and Marcia took out their tools and approached the ice. <laughs> <laughs> Leroy and Marcia had done well, cutting and polishing the face of the ice to a mirror-like finish, and although there had suddenly arisen more pressing matters, when I glanced into it I could hardly look away, seeing for a minute what we had originally come for. Innumerable innumerable bodies, lewdly contorted by a death that was not death, floating, suspended in the translucent ice flow in rank upon rank like soldiers in the tomb of an ancient Chinese emperor. Although they were all clothed in the fashion of centuries past, the unnaturally twisted garments lent no modesty to the scene. Laura and I had zipped in on the snowmobile. <laughs> <laughs> leaving the storm behind, or so she thought. But even here I could see the clouds building, whipping among the distant girders in the blue haze of the faraway ceiling. We have to go, I shouted. The facility has its own weather, and I don't think it likes us. <laughs> Belay that, Laura said. We must... At the least, retrieve Dr. Thorin. But there's no time, I interrupted. We can come back when things are under control. We can't make a plan without Dr. Thorin, she said. She opened the back of the snowmobile and pulled out a strange bit of kit I hadn't understood when she packed it. <laughs> if we can't take all of him, we'll take what we can. How could we even find him in all these? I said, motioning to the bodies. But Marcia interrupted me. There's a pattern. They're buried by date of freezing. Know when he was preserved, you know where to find him. September 8, 2014, Laura said. 
Then right there, Marcia indicated, Leroy was already on it, climbing over the ice, scraping off the loose snow, and quickly roughing out the surface with his pick as the clouds above continued to build and light flurries started floating down, sticking to his stocking cap. Marcia put a ladder against the ice floe, and Laura climbed up beside Leroy. Not that one, she yelled, waving an ancient photograph as the wind was picking up. Over there! And both Leroy and Marcia began digging, throwing chunks of ice and snow into piles. Thunder rumbled throughout the superstructure, shaking ice and rocks that had not been shook for untold ages. My god, I said. The solar-generated electricity that runs this place is interacting with the storm. It's thunder snow. <laughs> As I said that, the earth shook again, and rocks and snow began cascading down from above us. A giant rock crashed into where Marcia and Leroy were working. I wiped the snow from my eyes and saw Laura tugging at Leroy, his arms seemingly pinned under the rock. Where, where's Marcia? I said. Laura grabbed Leroy's pick, raised it high, and brought it down, severing Leroy's struck arm. Where's Marcia? I asked, but Leroy just cried, and Laura pointed under the rock. She continued her digging frenzy into the ice. There's no time, I said as the storm continued to build, the freezing wind biting through my parka, and no way to move an entire body. I don't need the entire body, Laura said, and she pulled something out of the ice, a little bigger than a bowling ball, and shoved it into her strange device. Okay, I got him, she said. What now? And white lightning flashed all around her. We have to go up, Leroy said. I hadn't noticed that in the time I had been distracted by Laura's actions, he had untied, or he had tied a tourniquet around his arm. We have to go up to the entrance or be buried alive. But what about Marcia, I thought looking at the pain in Leroy's face, but said nothing, knowing it was already too late. We three, with Laura's strange contraption, began descending the mountain that some fool, Dr. Thorin himself, I believed, had encased in this gigantic structure to that little cabin that marked our entrance and exit from this place. Is that the end of that chapter? Uh, yes. End of chapter... <laughs> we could just make it out. Leroy, I thought, and not for the last time, was an excellent Sherpa. Go, I shouted. Eventually the storm would peak and blow us off the face of the mountain, whether we hid behind this outcrop or no. If we were going to make it across the exposed plateau to the cabin, well, our odds were only getting worse the longer we waited. I half turned, expecting she would need to be coaxed. But Laura had already started across, still carrying that damnable jar. I grimaced and stumbled across the plateau. I couldn't see my way for the sh snow until we reached the shelter of the doorway. I had no idea if anyone else had made it. Leroy was right behind, helping Laura along. Whether by fate or by fortune, we all made it. The door had a single lot latch padlock. Leroy quickly produced a pry bar and snapped it apart. We entered, closing the door against the wind. Under a flashlight, we found a light switch, but it had no effect. The interior had a damp smell to it, which could only mean one thing. The wind howled and rattled the cab cabin violently. Laura burst out. Fuck! Fuck, 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 this fucking fuck! I rolled my eyes in the darkness. Laura, come on! We must summit by the solstice. This is not negotiable. Laura, just shut the fuck up and let me think. I could hear wrestling and Laura's flashlight join Leroy's in the darkness. I started to rummage for mine, but was interrupted by a sudden crash. Mm. Mm. Okay. Here, Laura had upended. Here, Laura had upended a table and revealed a trapdoor. There must be a connector here. Going overland was such a terrible idea. We should have taken the catacombs. Fuck. Well, she was probably right, as much as I hated to admit it. <laughs> but it was too late. <laughs> and now she was already climbing down. Leroy gave me a quick glance and followed her. <laughs> that left me a little choice. The ladder went several meters before opening into the ancient aquifer. This way, I can smell it. Leroy nodded to me and we followed her. The lighting still glowed faintly behind the walls as we jogged along. Soon I was panting. Miss, miss, this way, Laura turned. We must be careful, miss. The people, they lift traps in the catacombs. I fucking well know that. <laughs> Fuck. Laura was 
in fine form, but she had enough sense to follow Leroy. We turned down a corridor, away from the aquifer, but we were soon <laughs> facing a gate. <laughs> the keys were arranged in a circular pattern. Laura started counting, but I recognized the pattern. There would be 37. We would have to select eight signs from... Uh, a mo a Malaric poem. <laughs> the order wouldn't matter, but an incorrect poem would almost certainly trigger a trap. At worst, fatal. At best, meant to imprison us for processing by, <laughs> by, <laughs> by a police force that no longer existed. I closed my eyes. 35, 36, 37. Can you break it? Fuck. Laura looked at me. I knew if I hesitated, I would lose my nerve. I began to input the signals corresponding to the poem. Above the well, inside a star... I breathed a sigh of relief as the door slid open, but behind it was an inky blackness. This was bad. All hell broke loose. I felt the familiar wrenching in time sensation, as with slurp drive, but much smaller. I looked across and remember seeing Leroy's arm had <laughs> reached past the boundary, and now it was gone. <laughs> he cried out in shock and pain, and time folded in on its <laughs> <laughs> a warm center forming beyond us as time began to recoalesce I realized we were being placed back inside the cabin almost as soon I realized there would be nowhere for the waste energy to go reality snapped in place the contents of the cabin <laughs> Ignited almost to meet instantly. Laura was dazed, but aware enough to head for the door, away from the growing firefall, fireball. End of chapter five. <clears throat> oh. Chapter six. The snow blinded us when, Relo when Leroy yanked open the door with his remaining arm. Laura took a step back, faltering, juggled her great-great-grandfather's frozen head, which seemed to grimace through the swirling, cyrogenic fluid. But I could feel the flames behind me, and I admit I broke my promise and grabbed the head away from her. Go! I coughed, and the three and a half of us stumbled barefoot into the snow, the smoke pouring out of the door behind us. We weren't far when the first muffled explosion roared out from behind us, dust and ashes of long-dying dreamers bursting from the earth, all mixed together in the snow. Laura fell again, and Leroy helped her up, to no avail as they both tripped and slid down the hill. I took one look back at the dying facility, wrapped my body around Dr. Thorin's head, hoped the duct tape would hold as I tumbled down after the others, and a louder explosion shook the ground behind us, and the heat wave caught up to us. We ended up piled in a gully, rushing with black water melted out by the series of explosion, while snow slowly fell about us. What a waste, Laura said to the uncomprehending head. We could have, we should have saved them. That great library of long dead people, what stories they could have shared if they walked among us again today. <clears throat> we still have the doctor, Leroy reminded her. All we need to do is bring him back and he can rebuild. Once again, mankind will no longer fear death but save themselves for the future. He cradled Laura with his arm and he looked ready to kiss her. And she looked ready to kiss him. <laughs> I could see it all. These two, with their combined genius, would start it again. They would find some other long-forgotten cyrogenic, cryogenic facility and bring back, no matter how partially or painfully, those who slumbered there. But there was one thing they forgot. I still had the head. As their lips moved together, I unscrewed the bolts at the base of the device. The cold liquid dripped out onto the last two digits of my left hand, which would never again regain their feeling. I tilted the head to the side and slowly lifted off the cover, and the rest came gushing out as Leroy and Laura realized what I had done. It ends here! I cried, and Dr. Thorin's head fell into the sledge of the gully. Leroy's long arm knocked me off balance as I threw the remainder of the device at him. I gurgled and sloshed in the sledge, and two hands, I assume Laura's, held me down. I scrabbled, I scraped, 
I drowned. I died. The first time. And that's the whole story, my court-appointed attorney asked. From my perspective, what do you want? My guilt is written all over me. I wasn't used to being alive again. They had no right to bring me back. But the two of them carted away my dead body, frozen in the snow. They tattooed me with barcodes running up every limb and four times up and down my torso, front and back, the story of how I killed Dr. Thorin, and even had the gall to blame me for the destruction of a thousand wannabe immortals in centuries-old cyrogenic storage. They'll see you worse than a murderer. You should lay low, say it was an accident, say you don't remember what happened at the facility. This was hundreds of years ago. There's a new life out there for you to explore, sir, if you take it. But if you go with this, they'll think you set back the cause of cryogenic rejuvenation <laughs> a century. I only ever wanted one life. I shook my head on this temporary robotic body. <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to do if I confess? Kill me? My attorney actually laughed. I'm glad someone found it funny. End of The Head of Dr. Thorin by Ezekiel Beck. Ezekiel Beck. <laughs>